So, good afternoon. Welcome to the MOM workshop. This session will outline the challenges of traffic monitoring and measurement, and it will provide an insight to the achievements of projects which participate in monitoring and measurement cluster or MOM. And I would like to introduce Felix Struckmeyer from Salzburg Research, and he will give you the MOM project overview. So, Felix. Okay, thank you, Baiba. Um, <clears throat> I got 10 minutes to give you a short introduction into the MOM project, uh, which is a coordination action in the sixth framework uh, of IST. Uh, and I start with some facts, which are summarized on this slide. Uh, we are in this broadband for all strategic objective. Um, it, the project is as I told you, a coordination action, not the research pro, uh, project, the traditional one. So we are trying to coordinate uh, research. Uh, it durates 24 months. Uh, we started in January 2004 and uh, will end in December, December 2005. And we are eight partners uh, with a budget of a uh, bit above 700,000 euros. So I will start with a short introduction. What's our um, view on IP monitoring and measurement? Um, we have uh, here some use cases. Uh, most of you will know about the use cases of monit IP monitoring and measurement. It can be traffic control, traffic engineering. Um, you can use it for billing and accounting, security reasons, SLA, SLS monitoring, for QS measurements, delay measurements, whatever. Or if you have developed an architecture, you would use it for trials or evaluation of this architecture. So it's a broad range of applications for, uh, for tools. And uh, therefore, also many IST projects are dealing with that. And uh, yeah, so we want to um, coordinate these activities on this uh, area. So for these use cases, you can use measurement tools. Uh, a very rough uh, distinction is between active and passive measurements. You will get the measurement data. Uh, first, you get raw data. Then you can do some analysis to get analyzed data. You can aggregate or sample data. And the final results for measurement data uh, can be uh, things like traffic or flow characteristics. Um, you can give alarms, notifications if you detected some abnormalities, uh, or you can put graphs to view trends or whatever. And uh, there are some standards under development, uh, like metric standards, data exchange format standards, and sampling mechanisms. So that is what is covered with the MOM project. So what are our project objectives? Uh, we want to coordinate these, stand, uh, these uh, activities in this area. Uh, there are many IST projects which are dealing with that, but uh, only a, a few which have this as the core. Uh, mainly, it's, it's something at the edge you, you need in the, in the project. But uh, uh, so you have to deal with this. You have to cover it. But uh, you usually do it not so deeply, so uh, some such projects get our support. Uh, we provide tools and, uh, and information on the following things. Yes, I mentioned measurement tools. Uh, we collect information about measurement tools, evaluate and promote the interoperability between the tools. And we also do so with measurement data. Um, we will uh, we we look at measurement tools uh, which data formats they provide and we also want to provide a, a database where we collect data measurement data like traces uh, but also other kinds of data uh, convert it into our format and disseminate uh, it via a public uh, web interface so for these two 
areas we will uh, set up or we already started to set up uh, databases which can be publicly accessed. And we will coordinate activities in measurement standardization. Uh, therefore, we identify potential which projects are dealing with measurements, uh, what they uh, plan to standardize, and then coordinate joint contributions to the ITF or ITU or other re uh, standardization um, organizations. So, and uh, as a basis, we build a knowledge and exchange platform. As I told you, the two databases will be there, and we are presenting this on workshops and conferences like today and disseminate the activities. So we have also the, the corresponding work packages are like this, but I can go over this. So what are the projects which already gained or will gain uh, value through MoMA? We had in the past uh, three projects uh, which work uh, from the QS uh, part of, of the, uh, which had QS as, as their core. Uh, and it was the, the Cardinas, the Aquila project, and the NGN in initiative. Uh, so currently, we have uh, these following projects uh, as participants in the cluster. It's the 6QM project, the IST Intermon project, and the NGN lab project, as well as the SCAMPI project. From Intermon and SCAMPI, you will see a presentation afterwards. And we are targeting at the following uh, future projects. Uh, this is an excerpt of a list uh, which, we, which projects we have already contacted and um, will take up in the cluster. So what are uh, the MOME events? Um, this is part of uh, dissemination activities. Uh, we had already uh, a workshop in the January, uh, in March this year. Uh, the session, this session now is also part of, the, of our um, of our dissemination activities, um, and we already planned a session in December for at the Broadband Europe event, a symposium as well, uh, and we will ag again have uh, three workshops uh, next year. So that was all for the introduction to the to this uh, session, um, and feel free to look at our website or. Uh, where you can also uh, subscribe to our mailing list, the announced mailing list, which is mentioned on the slide. Are there any questions now for? Uh, questions for now? to Felix, please. Something. Otherwise, we can start with okay. the more technical things now. Yes, thanks. <laughs> and I would like to ask the next speaker, Ulrich Hoffmann from Salzburg Research to present Interdomain Monitoring or IST Intermon Project. Ulrich is a project manager of Intermon Project. Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you, Bible, for introducing me. Um, I'm not the project manager of Intermon. I was the project manager of yes, Intermon uh, during the last years, two years. Um, we uh, tried to develop an advanced architecture for inter-domain quality of service monitoring, modeling, and visualization. Uh, it was a project of 12 partners from eight countries, and uh, from the industry, we had NEC involved as a router producer, Siemens from the access technic side. Then uh, telecoms from Italy, the T-Lab, then TID from Spain, and T-Systems from Germany. Research organizations and universities like Fraunhofer, University of Bern, Uni University of Dortmund, Budapest University, CINI, that's a consortium of universities and research organizations in uh, Naples, 
Waterford Institute and Salzburg Research. I want to give you a short overview about our results. Uh, of course, a two years project, it was about six million project, 2.8 million funding. It's not possible to go into the details here. That's why it's, it's the first slide. It's very important to notice the web page. Uh, there all the detailed informations are available. In the first part, I will give an overview. And in the second part, I take one activity that is a part of activity of active QS monitoring and analysis. I will explain what we did there and some remarks at the end about future work. What was the motivation for this project? The motivation was that the ISP wants to enhance the interdomain quality of service business and to include there the analysis in large scale multi domain to offer a stable interdomain service. Suppose we have a source end system and a dis destination end system and we have two competitive ISPs, ISP S1 and ISP S2. Then, for example, an ISP S1 now has to aggregate the quality of services of the full chain to the destination to generate an offer to the source end system and to, uh, to win the competition against the ISP S2. So that means, for example, the ISP S1 has two possible paths to deliver the data packets to the destination end system. Here in this example, via ISP Transit 1 and ISP Transit 2. So to make a decision about the best path, including, of course, economical aspects, which were not uh, aspect in our project, uh, then he make a decision about the path to the destination, about some conclusions uh, of, uh, for the peering contracts, and that's behind this project. Uh, in, in detail, we had, of course, several work packages and activities, and here I only want to give you a brief overview, a list of these activities, how we tried to resolve the problems and to support the ISPs to manage this interdomain business. Um, first, of course, we have to uh, develop some tools for the ISPs for the interdomain writing and BGP protocol analysis. Uh, there we used the RIPE database for BGP for an analysis. The next activity was the monitoring in the interdomain scenario. Of course, there we, had, we had during the last days here a lot of presentations and uh, in the interdomain area, we think we have to uh, use a scalable measurement approach and the IP fix monitoring is such an approach. We were very strongly involved in the standardization activities of the IETF. <clears throat> the next then, of course, is now we have measured the traffic and the quality of service, which models can be used for traffic engineering, interdomain, Traffic engineering means alternative routing, network planning, adding some uh, capacity from the ingress to the egress router, new peering contracts and all this. Uh, and we, uh, one, in the first um, part of our project, there was an intensive discussion about the uh, right simulation approaches and analytical approaches. And one of these approaches was to use fluid simulation to model the traffic in a network as a fluid. We used uh, two approaches, the time continuous fluid approach and the time discrete uh, continuous uh, approach. Modeling the bandwidth you, uh, used during, in a, in a de defined time slot. Uh, the colleagues from the T-Lab in Italy, they were involved in, uh, in a work package uh, using the analytical modeling. Uh, we think that in uh, very low loaded links, we can use the MG lossless models very well. 
the next uh, part of our work was the visual data mining, uh, the development architecture for this to help the operator to interpret uh, the different events happening in such uh, monitoring scenario. For example, I will explain it a little bit later, uh, to differentiate between router anomalies and route changes. Uh, I already had explained our work in measurement base. Ah, then uh, the measurements, sh of course, should be connected to the simulation uh, tools. I already mentioned our fluid approach. And so we imported the IP fix measurements into the simulation models. To interpret the monitored results, we developed a pattern detection framework with outlier elimination. Uh, outlier, outlier elimination uh, depends, of course, from the, from the context of how you want to use the measurements. For example, for prediction modeling, uh, the ARIMA modeling, you have a specific uh, model for outlier elimination. Um, Pattern compression uh, is related to the problem that you, you make measurements in the internet. You have a lot of, of data at the end and uh, many of the uh, presenters during the last days here mentioned this problem and we here use the approach of piecewise linear approximation of the measurement data to, um, to com compress the data and we hope uh, that the loss of information is not so high. The technology behind was using a common quality of service database with policy controlled interworking of components. Here we see all these analysis and measurement components grouped around this database. Uh, as the active quality of surface measurement, I will explain in part two of my presentation. We have components for passive daily measurements realized by Fraunhofer uh, in Berlin. We support the interpretation and visualization of the monitored results by QS pattern analysis. And uh, the simulation toolkit uses the data, for example, from the IP fix measurements. We added into our active measurement tool a topolo topology uh, analysis component. I will explain it in part two of my presentation. I already mentioned that BGP4 protocol analyzer is a very important part uh, in the context of interdomain uh, evaluation of the different routes. Yes, IP, IP fix. Uh, is the, let's say the base for our modeling. Um, for example, if you want to derive a, a fluid model from the IP fix measurements, the IP fix measurements is a discrete measurement. You have a time slot and you get the bandwidth in this time slot. So how you uh, can derive a continuous load model. So that was a, a work done from Salzburg Research in this project. Uh, the model derived from the, from the IV fix measurements uh, had to guarantee that this model has the same mean of bandwidth, the same variance of bandwidth, and the same correlation of bandwidth. That was a modeling task for the colleagues <coughs> realizing the fluid simulation. Um, one word about the traffic matrix. The traffic matrix is very important for the ISPs to have a picture about the incoming outgoing transit traffic and to, to use it as an input for what if analysis, for example, I have uh, defined inquest, equest transit traffic, what would happen if I will put 10 or 20 other flows additional to this and uh, then we can use the simulation toolkit to get the information what with the delay, what's with the loss. Uh, some <clears throat> words in the second part about uh, one specific component of the Intermon project that is the active monitoring and analysis toolkit. The first picture again shows the problem. An ISP wants to know what's the best route to a destination. He can fix 
two active measurement scenarios, one going via the blue route and one via the black route. For example, he can install two agents, uh, SPA can install two agents in the egress point or near the egress point uh, of the domain A. And then, of course, he measures the quality of surface for different applications. As we know, or you can suppose, that in case of, for example, voice IVP, we have short packets, 100 or 160 bytes, it depends from the co codex, or file transfer, then we will have a different result from the active measurements. Uh, we did a lot of such trials here you see a measurement between Salzburg and Madrid. Uh, we measured this link for different uh, packet lengths. It's a similar picture you will get in case of you compare the di different routes. These are the components of this active measurement tool. <clears throat> On the left side you have the graphical user interface where you can edit the tests, you can specify the time when the test should start, the intervals, deterministic, stochastic, you can specify a different application like load generators or more abstract load generators. Um, this test scenario then will be stored in the measurement database and um, the CM caller pulls the measurement database and um, when the time is coming for the next test. The CM caller distributes the measurements around now to, uh, to the agents or demons. On the left side, for example, can be the sender, the load generator, on the right side, the <coughs> receiver, and the network between the IP network is measured and, uh, and the results are visualized via the GUI to have the possibility to measure the one-way delay, the equipment is uh, GPS enhanced, and so we can solve the problems. But it, measuring one-way delay is more uh, administrative problem. If you go with the GPS equipment to, a, to a ISP, sometimes it's a problem to install the antenna in the building. That is, on this level, the problem. We installed a so-called pattern database for searching for specific patterns which are of interest for the operators. On the left side, I gave, give you here an example. For example, it's interesting for the operator to detect a router anomaly or to, to differentiate between a router anomaly and a route change. So we can define a pattern. It's only very well, simple here. For example, you can say if one-way de delay is, is, is greater than two times the mean of the one-way delay, and this uh, high delay is singular, then it should or can be a router anomaly. Then you specify the measurements, the sending rate, the packet size, the duration, the source, the destination, make the measurements, and at the end you realize the analysis uh, go via, uh, through the measurement results and you can find if there is a one-way delay uh, greater than two, two times the mean and singular, then we have a router anomaly, otherwise it's a pass change. Therefore, we need a pattern database and, of course, a quality of service monitoring database where the measured data are stored, the so, so raw data. In case of such a scenario, the, the operator sees there is a high delay. He's interested to know what's behind this event. And um, one possible interpretation would be there is a root change. And to find this out, uh, we integrated into this active measurement tool an active topology discovery. Here you see the visualized path of such a measurement scenario. 
And uh, if I, in case I'm an operator and I see there a very dramatic increase in one-way delay, the next step would be to go into this picture and to compare is there a, was there a route changed or not. And this is a, a, a more complete information about the quality of service and, and the path from the destination to the uh, from the source to the destination. In this visualization, we see the number of hops, the availability of the routers. That means some ISPs switch off the ICMP, and so they are a little bit hidden. But based on the time to live counter, we know how many are between, so, so that we can integrate the these hidden routers in this visualization. This, this um, visualization, the reporting can be uh, triggered long term or short term. That is a parameter in the system. And this is an example for, of a measurement between Salzburg and Madrid. Uh, red colored are the routers which are not responding. The brightness is around trip time. And sometimes, you know, you know, like how the round trip time measurement works. Sometimes the um, router between can respond uh, higher round trip time than the end router it, it, because it's a stochastic measurement and a sequential measurement. And such anomalies we color here blue. To aggregate the data, we use the piecewise linear approximation. Uh, we say data, we see the data as a sequence of straight lines. And we, of course, we have to optimize the trade off between such an aggregation and the loss of information. But it is a, a tool for the operator, and it's not so uh, much about the modeling in this Intermoon project. We offer the tools here. So we can. Uh, generates different pieces like plane uh, sequence of measurement results, increasing line of measurement results, and decreasing line, and uh, the parameter for calculation of this decrease in increasing plane is, uh, is D, the distance parameter. Uh, then these lines are described by a pattern description language, and here you can see the output of such a one minute? Five. Five. Here see the output of, of such a, uh, aggregation. Uh, in the middle, you really can see an, an outlier. And uh, I already mentioned now, I, I'm as an operator, I'm interested in what is behind this, such an outlier. I go and do the topology visualization to see has the route has changed, or is this really a, a router anomaly, some, some Years ago, uh, there were some papers about four second delay in some Cisco routers, and I don't know if they, if they fix the bug or not. Sometimes it happens that we have a high delay in a, a router without a route change, but to know what happened, uh, we combine it with a topology visualization. This time series here is described in this PDL. Some words about the future work. Of course, the project now has ended, and uh, we are now in an in a optional dissemination phase, my presentation here, too. Um, but, of course, we want to continue with our research. First is to improve the outlier analysis. Um, the, our co partners are very interested to use these intermoon results for the network planning purposes. And uh, prediction models are important for network planning. And uh, there are different prediction models. One of them is the ARIMA model. And the ARIMA model then uh, has special requirements for outlier elimination. Next is the symbolic representation for pattern detection. Uh, I already have shown you that uh, such values like quality of service this is in the, in the set of the real numbers, the results. This is a real number. But you can uh, get um, a higher aggregation if, in case you map these real values into a, a, a symbolic representation in a specific alphabet. 
uh, evaluation of the trade-off between information loss and compression is very uh, important. Um, we want to install an interdomain forum cluster. Um, we hope that in the third call we can contribute and write a proposal. Uh, the companies like Siemens are very interested to continue to work in audio quality of service pattern analysis and here we want to go the next step from the IP quality of service to the perceptual quality of service. That means the mapping between packet loss and delay to the perceptual quality of service like it is standardized by the ITU, there are different uh, standards. Uh, maybe some of you know it as MOS, mean opinion score metrics. The perceptual quality of, of audio is mapped into a scale between zero and five. Five is very good quality, zero is uh, nothing. Um, in, in our Intermon project, we developed an architecture for how the providers can interchange all these informations. Uh, especially Fraunhofer was very, and Zini very strong in this area, and I hope we can uh, come into discussion with Gian, for example, to use our results uh, that the different uh, ISPs uh, exchange their information about their quality, and uh, so we can uh, use the intermodal results. The mobile cluster, already have, you have seen here what happens there. And of course, the hot topic of all presentations of the last days is anomaly detection for network security. And um, the next steps in monitoring and modeling for network planning are important for, for us. And uh, last week I had a discussion with a company in Germany uh, which offers a network planning tool and they informed me that now they have a big pressure from a US company, Opnet, maybe you heard about it as a simulation tool. Now Opnet goes into this business and uh, um, they advertise that with Opnet you can solve all problems in an ISP network. And you can simulate, per packet I think, um, what happens in the network if a link is cut. Huh? And I'm sure that will not work. So, and that will be an interesting task for the next time to use our simulation approaches uh, to support such companies with good models for network planning. So that's the end. Thank you for your attention. Okay, questions? Okay. Thank you. Please, questions? Story. Okay. You have the Intermon web page. Okay, there is Intermon page, and thank you again. And I would like to ask the next speaker, Yuri Novotny from the University of Masaryk. Yuri is a hardware specialist, or as he likes to say, hardware guy, and uh, he is working on a combo six cards for various IP IST projects, including SixNet and Scumpy. But right now he's going to talk about Scumpy and uh, Scumpy programmable hardware for network monitoring. Please, Yuri. Thank you, Baiba. <laughs> okay. Uh, I will talk about the Scampi project and um, opposite of other presentation, I will talk a little bit more about the hardware on the lowest level of the network monitoring things. So um, I will start with um, a short uh, overview of um, Scampi project. So Scampi project is IST project from FIST framework. It's two and a half year, and right now we make decision to uh, to uh, add another six months to finish the work. It was started in April 2002. Uh, right now we have uh, nine partners, and um, there are our objectives. Uh, you can see that uh, we go through the network monitoring of on the not on the horizontal way, like just one layer. I mean application or middleware or something like that, but we, do, we go through the vertical way from development of our own hardware and the development, it's, we, uh, one of our objective is to develop the 10 gigabit per second hardware. Uh, we go through the middleware and uh, also we developed some monitoring and measuring tools. 
and we would like to also investigate strategies and methodologies for monitoring system operating at uh, 100 gigabit per second and more. So uh, I will go very, very quickly through the application because it's upper level. So in uh, our project, we work on the intrusion detection. Uh, we use Nord signatures. There should be mentioned that we use uh, a hardware acceleration. So we uh, have on our boards uh, special memories named contents addressable memory, which we, which we can use for the hardware acceleration of uh, finding Nord signatures or virus signatures. Uh, we work on DOS attack detections, QOS application. In QOS application, there is also very important hardware of hardware accelerations, for example, uh, for measuring one-way one -way delay, you need to have some uh, equipment for uh, precise timestamp time stamp unit. So it was mentioned in previous presentation. And we also work on flow reports. Uh, I will go a little bit down into middleware. Uh, right now, a lot of mo there are a lot of monitoring application uh, in the world, but it's uh, just pieces. It, it's uh, just application which thinks which solve one problem. Uh, our goal is uh, to go a little bit complex, and we would like to develop the middleware. Which, is, which can cover on one side support for, uh, for variety of applications. On the other side, we would like to support that application on several, or on, on several types of hardware. From standard NIC, for 100 megabit network, you don't need any special hardware. On the other side, we, we would like to be able to support 10 gigabit cards with some, with many of functionality uh, direct in the hardware. So, uh, design goals are make quick and easy implement new monitoring application. Uh, we need to have a low overhead because we work on very high speeds. We would like to support multiple concurrent users and applications. It's very important because. Uh, Many of existing applications run just for one user and and uh, one application, but we would like on because the hardware is very expensive, we would like to give uh, people opportunity to have uh, multiple applications running on the hardware so we can save the cost of the boards because there are more applications running on one one board or one one card. We, we also work on global optimization. It means there are more users interesting about packets, for example, on port 80. We would like to uh, process them in hardware just one time. Don't do the same measuring for two people, so we would like to join it. And uh, our approach is to be transparent for the different hardware adapters. So, and right now we have support for SCMPI adapters. I will talk about the, probably the rest of presentation. We support DAC cards from end days, which are on the market, and we also support uh, standard NIC cards. So there is variety of hardware you can use from lowest level to highest level. Okay. Uh, there is how MAPI work. It's very similar, like you work with uh, files in file system. You create MAPI flow. So it's initially it, uh, the all necessary equipment. You apply function to a flow. You can apply BP, BPF filter, string search, packet counter, bind counter, and, and so on. And after that, you read results. Uh, what is important is that if hardware is not suitable to make some functionality, for example, BPF filter direct in the hardware, it's done in software. It's something what we in a hardware world say, hardware software co-design. Some functionality is done in software, another functionality is done in hardware. And if necessary, you put the functionality down to the hardware if you have not a lot, if you have no resources in software. And uh, MAPI daemon communicates with hardware and uh, process packet in software if necessary. So, and uh, I will go to 
um, to programmable hardware. So why we use programmable hardware? Uh, today computers are not able to process traffic monitoring at very speed, talking about gigabit and 10 gigabit speeds. Uh, there are a lot of tr problems or issues with that, mainly is PCI bus throughput. Even in a fastest computer today, PC computer today, it's uh, 8 gigabit per second, so you cannot monitoring 10 gigabit. Uh, 10 gigabit uh, on the speed, but uh, the PCI bus is uh, just one one piece of cake, and other ones are interrupt latency, which is in Intel computers more than horrible. There is slow disk access, slow memory, and so on and so on. So, if you need to really do really hardware, uh, really um, network monitoring on high speed, you have to have some kind of a hardware acceleration. So. If you start to talk about, if we start to talk about hardware acceleration, we can start to talk about ASICs, which are on the market. But ASIC chips are not flexible enough because the uh, conditions on a real network, on a real monitoring, or real networks change very rapidly. So when you develop the uh, ASIC chips, it's uh, obsolete. So you cannot use that standard approach. You can use ASICs for some part, but you cannot use it for application running in the so hardware. So there is another approach. It's a programmable hardware acceleration. So you can use uh, programmable programmable hardware. There are several ways of programmable hardware. We'll talk about the FPGAs. Uh, it's um, pieces of um, silicon which are very similar with a computer. It cannot do anything. It's totally stupid. If when you bring it on the table. But it start to be clever when you put it inside in, in computer world, you put inside operating system and application. And it's the same in this hardware, but the but the blocks are smaller than than computer. So you program your your devices to do some to do application you need to do. Uh, I will later on in presentation talk a little bit more. Um, and talking about SCMPI adapters, uh, they are based on combo family developed by CESNET and Masaryk University together in a Liberator project. Or, and uh, as by, like as Bybus said, it's used for CESNET. It was used for CESNET too. Uh, it is used for CESNET too. So now we will go into pictures. So there we have, uh, there we have uh, Scampi adapter. Uh, uh, there is one thing what I should mention. The all firmware and all design are, are free. So we would like to bring into uh, re, uh, research and development community something what we say open hardware. Yeah? Like we have uh, Linux or BSDs, like open software. So we would have something to, very similar with hardware because uh, there are a lot of people which has pretty nice pieces of hardware because, the, for example, DAC and, and other cards are very nice piece of hardware, but it's like black box. You should use the just black box. We would like to open the black box, and if people are able to work with it, so they can go inside the black box. If on other side, they can just review what's inside. On other hand, they can improve it, if they can. So there is the third card. It's com so it's a uh, that card over here. The card um, I talked about the network monitoring adapters. It has no network. It has no network interfaces. I will explain. Uh, the her the heart of the card is uh, Vertex FPGA from Xilinx. We use on that card uh, 300, uh, 3 million gates ch chips. We can go up 6 million, and in uh, next version of card, we will go, can go ten, up 10 million gates with the chip. We have uh, on the card uh, static memory. We have PLX chip for the connection into PCI bus. We have up to gigabit, gigabyte uh, dynamic memory, DRAM on the board. It's standard PCI, PC memory. And uh, what is very important are Z2 connectors. And we can very we can simply click on the board interface card, 
And the, the reason is uh, very simple, the card is expensive. And changing of just simple card, we can change the interfaces. So we don't need to redesign all the board for, for new interface, kind of interfaces. And uh, just curious, that part doing something useful, and that part are power supply for it, so it's crazy. <laughs> the status of the card, card is uh, fully operational, but start to be obsolete. It's our first card. There are some flow, not functional, but some part of card doesn't work on full speed what we need. So we are going to redesign the card. And the new one will be Combo 6X. It's a new design of Combo 6. We will, we will have two Xilinx Pro on the, on the board. Uh, one Xilinx will be the same, will have the same functionality like that. And second Xilinx will be used for the, for the, instead of a PLX chip for the PCI connection. So with that approach, we can go up with the throughput of the PCI bus to eight gigabit per second if we make decision to buy PCI X core. What is really important is that we have three power PC on the chips, two power PCs in one, one Xilinx and set third power PC on in second Xilinx. Uh, it's crazy because uh, right now we talk about the hardware inside the computer and with the new car we will have another computer, another PC computer or another, PC, another computer inside the chip and we have three of them. If there are not really fast, there are 400 megahertz power PCs, but you can do a lot of work on it. And what is very important, there are Linux and NetBSD running on, the, on that power PC. So you can have three computers inside. So, <laughs> and, uh, the Combo 6X with FPGA and PCI core will be ready redesigned to express PCI. Maybe you know that uh, PCI bus start to be a little bit obsolete. It's first, it's it is last in a last part of his life, and will in uh, this the PCI seek organization working on new standard of uh, computer bus. It's express PCI. It says totally different topology, and we would like to be able to uh, bring card with Express PCI on the end of this year, because the chips what we use has all necessary uh, hardware parts in the chip, so we need to uh, bring to do some tests and, and so on, so to, to, to write drivers, but hardware is ready. So we need to just change the connector and do some slight changes. Uh, I will talk about the interface card. First is a card with uh, four gigabit ports. It's um, nothing special on the card, four gigabit ports. And uh, we have uh, two more Xilinx on the chip and on the board. And we have two more uh, memories. Uh, that, that Xilinx have, each of them has uh, two million gates on that board, so the combo right now has uh, f 7 million gates and we can go up both cards about 11 or 12, if we populate better, uh, fast, bigger. The card is in fully operational stuff. Second card is uh, combo X XFP. It's a card which can run it has uh, XFP cages, you can hot swap uh, transceivers. The family of, tra of transceiver is very wide. You can use from uh, multi-mode like that guy f uh, f to mono-mode, uh, even CWDM you can use. You can switch it in runtime, so you can just pull it off, pull it on. We can also use uh, Cooper GBX like that. Uh, but still has makes sense to have that card because it's because of price of card because it's a little bit a little bit expensive okay going on. there is our flagship I have no the card with me because uh, our uh, my hardware guys work on uh, activation the card uh, right now 
CARTIS activated data passes up and running. We, we have a very simple networker car based on that interface card and combo. And uh, the card has um, one Xilinx FPGA we use Vertex 2 Pro also with power PC, so combo can have, can, can have up five power PC on the boards. There is another CAM for, uh, for pattern searching, SARP EEPROM, and gigabit ports are also in XFP cages. In, uh, we have four gigabit, there are SFP cages, for 10 gigabit there are XFP cages, but uh, we have trouble to buy them from the producers. It's another story. Okay, so there is combo PTM car. It's uh, another card. Uh, it's compared to previous card. It's more simple. We have Xilinx FPGA on the card. We have a very low level processor on the card, and there is PLX connection to the to the PCI. What is important is that part. It's very precious, precious crystal, uh, and the card is uh, can be used like either standalone or together with combo as a timestamp generator. There are connectors for GPS, so you can connect GPS to the card and you can, you can have very, very precise hardware, timestamp hardware in your computer. Uh, because the PCI bus is too slow for transfer of uh, timestamps, we have another Connectors we can join with special cable, both cards together. So card is in activation phase right now. Now talking about SCMPI adapters, there are how it looks like. So SCMPI for MTX is, is set of three cards and so on. And there is available any combination, combo six or with uh, interface card or combo six X. So the cards are compatible. Uh, talking about SCMPI firmware, SCMPI firmware has a modular design. We use uh, VHDL uh, language for development of the, of the firmware. Uh, we use a little bit uh, higher level of uh, uh, imagination. We use nanoprocessor. We don't use a final machine, final state machine like we use really in hardware. We use uh, nanoprocessors. This is something between uh, between final state machine and between a uh, risk processor because um, we would uh, we know that there is the problem with uh, price of uh, development tool for VHDL as there is not a lot of people which are able to work with VHDL but they can work with nanoprocessor which are inside the inside the FPGAs and we prototype firmware blocks in software and I talked about hardware software co-design is the same uh, like I talked about the SCMPI approach, we uh, do almost all things in software first and after that we push the functionality in the hardware. Uh, there is the picture of the SCMPI design. Uh, the, that SCMPI design was uh, described in presentation on Laja Smotlacha, so I will don't waste time to go once more this presentation just for the several word now you have timestamp unit here there are f filtration there are two we have we use for classification of packet uh, two nanoprocessor one is header field extractor which take important information from the header of packet and after that we do classification and there are some hardware units for network monitoring. First, is statistic unit. You know, you see that if packets work is processed just statistic unit, we no, don't need send the packet in the host computer, so we save the time of the host computer. There we have sampling unit, which need packets to send into host computer memory. So there is process data, data of header and there is process all packets which is stored in FIFO and if statistic or payload checker unit need the packet so it's go in the, the local the dynamic memory and after that in the host computer. And the third block is payload checker which can, which can help with, for example, with virus identification. 
There is another picture of the firmware. It's a firmware for a timestamp unit. It's don't don't see it a little, uh, really complicated, but for example, that piece if we need on very high speed to add 64 bits, and it's a little bit issue time to time. Talking about uh, SCMPI software, we have uh, Linux driver for all the stuff we talk about. We have MAPI on for Combo 6. We have software simulator on for of Combo 6 because Combo 6 uh, development are running parallel with the other uh, the rest of the project. So uh, it's we want we don't want to wait when the hardware is up and running. So we have simulation of combo cards on top of standard NIX. We have uh, development environment for nano programs uh, because it uh, doesn't make sense to develop the program with uh, just in uh, just in machine code. It doesn't make sense. So we have software for it and we have some debugging and other tools. So it's the end of my presentation. You can find more information even on Scampi scumpy mail list or or liberator pro on mailing on list of liberator project so okay. thank you very much thank you, Yuri. <laughs> please questions from the floor <coughs> yes Uh, it's <laughs> a very good question. I will ask Arne to help me if I am not really correct because I am hardware guy. He's <laughs> on the middle, or other guys which are on top of. But for example, uh, you uh, you can uh, in many applications you can benefit from the hardware acceleration. For example, you can use filtration. If you can filter packets in the hardware, they don't go through PCI bus into software. So you you save time or tr or power of your computer. So it's just just one issue. Second, if you do sampling in the hardware, so according some set of rules, you sample packets with some. We can sample uh, not just uh, first, third, fifth, or fifth packet, but with some probabilistic and something like that. So you also save time of your computer because you don't need send packets over PCI bus. You save your PCI bus and you save uh, p p uh, interrupt latency. And what are you and what you really need in hardware is type timestamps, because if you have standard uh, NIC card and card came into into. Uh, the packets came into hardware, into NIC card. You don't know how long operating system needs to withdraw packet from the card. Okay, there is another question on the back. Yeah. Uh, we have something like this. Uh, say scumpy TCP dump. So we are able to support uh, almost all, not all, all features, but almost all main features of uh, TCP dump in hardware. And uh, maybe, Arne, could you? Uh, BP, yeah, it's a BPA filtering. OK, thanks. There was another question. Um, as kind of networks get So you mean uh, that, um, yeah, it's a, uh, um, yeah, uh, we, to, 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 to be with the line, with the speed of networks, we, we, we have to develop and faster and faster uh, hardware and people from network will develop faster and faster network, it's go hand to hand, so we are, we want to do that. But right now we are uh, we have 10 gigabit cards with more or less uh, top of uh, today world. When we know about solutions with uh, 40 gigabit or 10 gigabit, 10, 100 gigabit, we would like to do that, of course. And uh, 
the thing is that still is the gap between hardware and software. Uh, you can do a lot of functionality, what we accelerate, accelerate by hardware right now, with uh, commodity PC, commodity cards, without any problem, in 100 megabit speed per second you can do that. When on the gigabit it's, it's the question, it's very question, on 10 gigabit you can, no, you can, but still, the computers go up, uh, the, the power of the networks go up, so we have to follow them. I give you an example, six years ago I start to write some uh, encryption algorithm f in the uh, in the hardware for the hardware and the gap between hardware and software at the time was 1000 so hardware acceleration was 1000 higher than software ones it was uh, six years ago so we had pc 130 33 something like that and now it's go up so you can do some hardware encryption, and the gap is maybe not three, three decades, maybe two and a half, maybe two, I don't, I'm not sure. I'm not experiencing that I right now. So there is still a lot of things which needs hardware support. Okay, thanks. Any more questions? Okay, then thank you, Yuri. Yuri. And I would like to welcome the next, the last speaker, Arne Oslebo from Uninet. Arne is also working in the SCAMPI project, but uh, now he's going to talk about monitoring issues in the Uninet. Okay, thank you. As in this presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we monitor our network and the challenges we have met and a little bit about the solutions we have done uh, to make it work. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go into great details, but hopefully we'll get some advice about, the, about at least what we think is important. But uh, yeah, so that I'll first talk a little bit about uh, Uninet, why we do monitoring, and also the challenges uh, we have met. So, first a little bit about UNET. So we are the Norwegian NREN, and we have, uh, we, also the company was started in 1987. We have now around uh, 280 customers in higher education and uh, research. We have about 58 employees in four different uh, companies. We have uh, the normal NREN, or Internet Services, which provides uh, internet to the research community. We have one company who uh, controls the NO, .no domain name. We have one that provides administrative systems to, uh, to the customers. And we also have one that provides networking advice for lower schools, as a higher elementary schools, and so on. Our uh, backbone <coughs> uh, network is uh, two and a half gigabit per second. And we have a uh, 10 gigabit uh, connection to Nordinet, which also connects to uh, Giant Network. So a little bit about why we do monitoring. Well, first of all, we do monitoring for probably for the same reasons as most other people. We want to detect network problems before the customer starts complaining so that you can fix it as quickly as possible. We also do some quality of service uh, monitoring so to see that the network behaves properly. We do it for capacity planning and uh, traffic engineering. And we also uh, do some security uh, analysis on it, as we do have uh, detectors uh, attacks, and we also store uh, NetFlow records for evidence, as if, if there is a security incident, we have at least two months of uh, NetFlow data so that we can go back and uh, prove things. And we are also involved in various uh, types of research. That's mostly in cooperation with uh, universities. But we also have something in the SCAMP project. We are the partners uh, directly in that to uh, develop new hardware, as you, as you just saw. We also had some projects into micro measurements where you look at uh, sub second intervals in, uh, on the network traffic. And we also looked at some uh, delay through one single router. Again, it's mostly students who have done it as part of projects at universities. Yeah. 
This is an old presentation, I'm not sure what's happened. <laughs> no, it was downloaded just recently. Yeah. I uploaded one yesterday. Uh, okay. Let us try the new yeah. one. <laughs> the same one. Hmm? No, it's the same. Yeah, that's all, it's five slides. <laughs> <laughs> Is it possible to, it yeah, I have computer. it on my computer. Uh, sorry for this, in yeah, sorry. it's lost somewhere in between. <laughs> Just have to stop running. I'm sorry for the delay here, but. <laughs> That's why we were encouraging speakers to put presentations yeah. up so early. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, I would like to suggest before you leave, you take a chance and look at the combo cards in close while Yiri have them in the room. Because I guess he will not take them with him next day, so this is the only chance. Okay. I'm just waiting for windows, but... Mm -hmm. uh, Okay, now it looks like it should be up and running again. I just okay, then uh, what I want to say is a little bit about how we monitor uh, the network. As probably everyone else, we use uh, SNMP for some basic uh, collection of uh, traffic statistics. As we, uh, mostly, but we mostly use uh, our own tools that we have developed. We have a tool called Sino that uh, can collect uh, network traffic and uh, error uh, rates and things like that from the routers. It uh, can plot statistics in a map and you can also get uh, thresholds and error messages uh, back from it. We also have a tool called uh, Genplot, which is a more generic uh, plotting tool that can plot any uh, SNMP uh, variable. So we use it to plot CPU usage and uh, memory usage on the routers and so on. The reason why we mostly develop our own software is that so far we have uh, not found, also we uh, emphasize a lot on statistical properties and a lot of the tools, especially commercial, don't have what we want. So we have, uh, usually we hire students who uh, they, um, do it as summer jobs. We also do some active uh, measurements and uh, that's where we also have a tool we developed called Mping 
which is just a uh, measure the round trip time on various links and I can get statistics and uh, you also store it for uh, um, so you can get history of how the uh, network develops. And then we do uh, net flow uh, statistics. We have never used to collect the float, uh, net flow, we use flow tools, which is an open source program. But then as part of the Scampi project, we have developed uh, software called FlowRap, which is a generic uh, flow-based reporting application. So you can, uh, it's, it takes the raw net flow data and generates uh, reports and stores it in a database. And then you have a web front end that you can use to post reports. And we also use some packet-based uh, monitoring, which is for, for part of the Scampi project. And uh, while we are still waiting for the first Scampi adapters, we are also using uh, their cards. But so far, the um, passive packet-based monitoring is only used for research. We don't use it for the day-to-day -day operations of the network. So, what kind of challenges do we have in the monitoring of uh, the network? Well, first of all, we have hundreds of customers, devices, and links. And if you start looking at uh, VLANs, you're talking about thousands. So doing uh, monitoring on a small network is uh, relatively easy. When you get up to these numbers, you have to be, uh, design the system carefully. You have to have good visualization, good user interface, and you also have to know how to handle the data. For example, in uh, NetFlow, right now we only collect uh, data from the main routers. But we are still collecting about 7 gigabytes per day, and that's uh, compressed data. So it's normally compressed by a factor of 1.6. That's the uh, same as 290 megabytes per hour that has to be processed where you can generate statistics. It might not sound as too, uh, that much, 290 megabytes per hour, but uh, the, that data has to be processed for each report type you want to go through. So it's uh, quite a lot of work to do, uh, do it. And for uh, their cars, as if you look at uh, packet-based monitoring, as we just took one trace on a uh, one gigabit link into the main university, and that was only the headers we captured, but we, that generated 37 gigabytes of uh, data. So it's uh, quite a lot of data to analyze if you want to do it in real time. Another problem that we have in our network is that it's very uh, dynamic. Also it's on the routers, the if index of a certain line can often change because uh, network cards are moved around. So when we generate statistics, we have to be careful that you have consistency in the data because uh, if one day the if index might mean we have a completely different line. So we have to uh, detect that automatically and keep it updated. And also, uh, you have to know what you want to monitor, and that's very uh, di often difficult before you actually start looking at the data. So we, uh, as much as possible, we try to make uh, generic solutions so that you can add new report types and new things you want to look at uh, afterwards. So just a little bit about uh, the solutions we have done. First of all, to uh, manage so you, it's not possible to look at all the links and uh, devices one by one if you have hundreds of them. So it's important to have overview reports where you can sort by the important uh, values. This example you see here, it just shows the CPU load on the routers we have. So you can uh, see you have the busy value, you have peak value, and you have average. And it's just sorted where you have the highest load on top. And if you combine this with uh, some kind of threshold, for example, that if you mark things red, if you got to go above uh, a certain threshold, you can easily see where problems are. So even if you don't look at the numbers, you can quickly look at, uh, so if you have, for example, different background color, you can uh, quickly see the problems. And you can also generate uh, alarms if things uh, happen. And if you have lots of other different types of data, it's important that you can sort on the value you want. It's also important to uh, keep the statistics for a long time so that you can uh, look at the trends and how things evolve. For example, again, this is also about just uh, CPU load, but then you can easily see uh, that uh, in the beginning of November last year, something special happens. Because this, uh, this shows the CPU load for the entire year. So this here was actually a distributed DOS attack incident that happened. But at the same time, it's also important to have uh, good usability. And uh, that's what we have to mean, that the interface has to be uh, easy to use. 
So if uh, an operator looks at this, it should, uh, it should be possible to click on it and then zoom in and see what's happening at this interval. And you should also be able to navigate back and forth between uh, different types of uh, reports. We are not quite there yet, but uh, we will soon be able to, for example, if you click in this app, the screenshot this has been taken from, if you click here, you will be able to zoom into uh, that one for that day to see what was happening. And we will also be able to jump to, for example, the NetFlow uh, reports we have for that specific uh, time. That way you could easily see what type of traffic it was and you could hopefully identify what was happening. Oops, okay, sorry. Also to have, uh, be able to handle the load, uh, you have to do uh, distributed processing. As, you, as I mentioned already, you had uh, seven gigabytes of uh, natural records uh, every day. So the way we do monitoring, we uh, have four different uh, locations where we have a PC collecting the natural data. You can see one's in uh, Far North in Tromsø, we have one in Trondheim, in Bergen and Oslo. So the routers closest to this PC send the NetFlow data there. And on each of these locations, the, you generate the uh, reports so that you can have uh, fully distributed and you have time to do more work. But we still have one centralized location where we have a database that stores all the reports we are interested in. So when you have a bottleneck like uh, that, you have to be very careful about the, the design. I'm not going to go into details about this, but uh, this shows the database uh, schema for the FlowRap application. Uh, we spent quite a lot of time designing this schema because we wanted a completely generic solution that was, uh, that it was easy to add new report types. And we also wanted one that was able to scale to uh, the data load we have here. So for example, in one table alone, we have uh, now up to, oh, sorry, we have uh, up to 33 million entries, and that's just in one uh, source port uh, table. So what we have done is that for each report type, we have separate tables, and also for each uh, time interval. So it might be a bit difficult to read here, but that says uh, protocol hour, protocol day, protocol week, protocol month, and you could continue a year, for example. We could also go down to if you want five minutes interval. The software uh, is completely generic, so you can easily add new time intervals uh, if you want to. You have uh, so there's a database schema here, it says time period, so you can describe the time period here. So all the tools and the scripts that work on the database can just read the description about a time period and then you can add your own as you want. And this one also keeps uh, track of the uh, changes that we have in the if index uh, uh, on the routers. As I said, that changes quite a lot in our network. And uh, we have at least up to two months uh, of NetFlow data stored. And often when we, can, okay, we find out that we want a new report type, then we want to go back and uh, load all the old data so that we can, we can go or get it into the database. But since the if index might have changed, we have to keep a complete log of the changes so that you can get the correct data in. And then a little bit about aggregation. As you probably know, it's not possible to store detailed information uh, forever. At one time or another, you have to uh, start deleting the detailed information. Of course, one of the most common uh, aggregation method is NetFlow. There you take uh, IP packets, and you go, uh, Oops, sorry. aggregated into uh, flow records. But you can also aggregate, uh, for example, if you have reports in uh, our uh, resolution, you can re aggregate that up to uh, day, week, month, and so on. So in that way, you can uh, keep the detailed statistics available for, for example, in uh, the flow app, we are now keeping the detailed data, uh, our uh, reports available for one year. After that, the, they will start being deleted, but you will still have the day report. And you will, then will, later on, you will have week, month, and so on. So at least you have some information about the time period you want. But you have to be very careful when you do aggregation, because sometimes it can lead to inaccurate results. This shows an example about the source port report uh, 
that we have in FlowRap. <coughs> so, because of that, right now we only store information about the 200 uh, most commonly used ports. But even so, we are now up to more than 30 million entries in one table. So it's not possible to store information about all the ports. So you have to uh, cut down. So in this example, you can see that, say that as an example, that you only uh, can afford to store the three most commonly used uh, ports. So then you have t uh, two different time periods here, where you each of them you store the three most commonly used. Then you aggregate them to a higher level uh, time period. And then you just add, just add the numbers that you have. So, for example, port 1 has uh, 20 bytes here and uh, 10 here, so you get 30, and so on. But the problem is that for the two down here, so port 4 and port 3, you didn't store anything in the lower uh, time period, which means that you get inaccurate results. So port 4 and 3, this is the aggregated result. This is the correct one. So here you got uh, too few because you didn't store the information in the beginning. Uh, you can do things to avoid this. For example, the one, uh, what we have done in the FlowRap application is that for the lowest time period, we, in the beginning we store all the information. But when you have aggregated it, then we delete and only store the most commonly used one. So, uh, but the example is that you have to be careful of what, what you do so that you know that the results are statistically uh, correct. Now a little bit about uh, passive packet-based uh, monitoring. As I said, so far we only use it for research. And uh, when we do that, we mostly just store the disk and analyze it uh, later. So it's and up to two and a half gigabyte is relatively easy to do as long, long as you only do a header. If you want to do a packet load inspection, then you get into uh, problems with the PCI bus. So it's very difficult to store everything uh, to disk. Also, the disk speed is a big challenge. But if you want to do packet-based monitoring on an operational network so that you can use it for day-to-day -day operations, you really need real-time processing of the data. Otherwise, you would just get as your... The other option would be to store the disk, then stop storing and analyze it, and then start recording again. But then you will get big gaps in your data. And if you want to do real-time processing or, uh, on packet-based monitoring, you really need highly optimized code. This is something about the Scampi project is about. And you also need onboard processing capabilities on the network adapter. Okay. This is the last slide, just a summary of what I've said. As I said, when you have hundreds of customers, devices, and links, you need uh, good overview reports and good visualization. And you need easy-to-use applications where the users can uh, navigate easily between different time periods and also between different types of reports. Uh, when you have a huge amount of data, you need, usually, not always, but very often need distributed processing. But often you will end up with some centralized components, and then you need careful design and implementation of these. And when you do aggregation, you have to be careful so that you don't get uh, uh, statistical errors. And for us, as I said, in a dynamic network, you really need automatic detection of changes. And you need a history so that you can import old data and still get it correct. And for passive monitoring, you need, uh, if you want to do it on an operational network, you need real-time processing, fast algorithm, and processing capabilities on the network adapter. So that was the session. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Please, questions for Arne? Yes? Yeah. Since you monitor, store, and even distribute a lot of data, would it be desirable to somehow filter out the data that you send it out yourself? Yeah, that's mostly what we are, so, uh, the raw NetFlow data is stored at the different places, and then this generates the summary reports, and this data is stored in the central uh, place. Yeah. Okay, more? It's just the graph, the big thing. Yeah. I am not sure, actually. Uh, I just remember it was a denial of service attack. Uh, I can't remember the details about it. Uh, so. Okay, Karsten? Uh, 
right now it's the database processing, but we are running on a relatively uh, slow, okay, the PC is not that slow, it's a dual Xeon, but it's only one, got one gigabyte of memory, and the database is now up to 66 gigabytes, uh, so uh, we are upgrading now, and then it uh, will be, but so far it's still handling relatively well. And I can say that also the, the software uh, for FlowRap, as I mostly mentioned here, that will be available as open source. You can visit the Scampi project uh, site. It will, the first version will most likely be released end of July, beginning of August. Okay, any more questions? Well, okay. thank you very yeah. much, Arne. Well, thank you. <laughs> and thank you very much all for coming to the MELM workshop. I hope it was interesting and useful. So. I hope you will enjoy the evening in Rodos. <laughs> <laughs>